we have resources at our command through the radio. We can get patched in with a phone to what's called SAM. It's our maintenance people out in San Francisco. They know this airplane cold. They know all the systems. They have all the technical manuals. They have everything at their disposal. And if there's a backdoor way of pulling a circuit breaker or something to do, they can see this backdoor way of helping you out. The problem they were having was that whenever the engineer, Dudley Devorah, called them, Dudley said, we have lost all our hydraulics. And they said, okay, we've got a communications problem. That can't be the case. One in a billion. Hard to believe. It's almost impossible to believe. Maybe no hydraulics in one system or no hydraulics in two systems. They couldn't believe there was no hydraulics in three systems. So Dudley said, listen to me, number one hydraulic quantity, zero. Got it? Number two hydraulic quantity, zero. Number three hydraulic quantity, zero. Later on in post-accident, they said, we didn't know what to say to you because we were talking to four dead men. As designed, the airplane was no longer controllable. Two problems we talked about, the airplane going up and down the fugoid and the airplane's roll tendency. It was an immensely difficult thing for me to operate the throttles to mitigate both those issues at the same time. So I was looking over all the controls and switches and everything that I had knowledge of in the aircraft and uh, they had executed just about everything I think I would have attempted. But in the DC-10, if the hydraulic systems fail, there's always an emergency methodology to get the landing gear to free fall done. They weigh many tons, and if we can simply open the doors, they usually just free fall out and they lock into place. Now the byproduct of that, that's a hydraulic system. When the gear is stored and they're up in the airplane, we've got trapped fluid in some of these lines. And I thought, if we could get the landing gear down, the very motion of the gear going down forces that fluid back into the reservoirs. Somehow, some chance, some of that fluid could be recovered, not go overboard, and perhaps they could get back the control of the aircraft. And we talked about it. But there's a golden rule in aviation. It's kind of an unspoken rule, but it basically says this. If you ever find yourself upstairs with minimum control of your aircraft, don't change its configuration. In other words, don't put flaps down, don't put gear down, just leave it the way it is. You know the devil you have now. If you change, you may not like the devil you get. You may lose control of the aircraft completely. So we had a discussion. Now, what are the merits of putting the gear down? If we put the landing gear down, are we going to lose it completely and the airplane's going to be a smoking hole in Iowa? We don't know. Is it better to land in a cornfield with your landing gear up or your landing gear down? There's not much test data on this. Is it better to land you on a four-lane highway with the landing gear up or the landing gear down? There was interstate highways below us that we could have taken shots at. Is that a good idea? We don't know. Finally, the decision maker, Al Haynes, said, let's put it down. I don't think control-wise it can get any worse than it is right now. And besides, if it's down, it'll be a shock absorber when we hit. And so I executed the procedure to drop the gear. And we never did get back. The fluid evidently went right overboard again. But it seemed to me that the airplane was a little bit more stable with the landing gear down. I took my hands off the throttles long enough to put the harness and the seat belts on. And when I reached back forward, I put my hands back on the knobs. It struck me like a thunderclap. Dear God, I have 296 lives literally in my two hands. As I walked in the cockpit and I, I took in the pilot's behavior, the aircraft's behavior, the status of the engineer's panel, the first thing that strikes your mind is, dear God, I'm going to die this afternoon. The only question that remains is how long is it going to take Iowa to hit me? That's a very compelling moment in your life. Life was good, and here I am 46 years old, and I'm going to die. My wife was my high school sweetheart. I uh, loved her dearly, and I had three beautiful children. Where are we right now? Are we in love or are we at war? I talked to her the night before, and the last thing she said to me was, I love you, hurry home, I love you. And with that knowledge and that peace, I was ready to die the day if I had to. They knew I loved them to death. Eliminate the pitch fugoid. Keep the altitude, keep that right wing up. Guts intuition, whatever you want to call it. 
I'm just trying to find the right magic and trying to make these variations smaller and smaller and smaller to where they're manageable for an approach and landing. The problem was there was no constant. When you think you had one solved, the other issue would kick in. The wing would drop. One would not suffice for both. It was an intuitive response after a period of time. I had a sense that the airplane was going to do something. I had a sense that it was going to go in another direction. And knowing that it was reaching that point again, I would be proactive in my throttle control, getting in tune with the airplane to read the instrumentation and benchmarking things that happen at these certain points and try to lead it. Before the airspeed got to where it wanted to be and the airplane on its own would start up, I'd see it getting close, and I'd put the power in and maximum power, get the nose back up sooner and begin to climb. And then the speed started to decay backwards. That's it, power's off. Intervening before the natural process took place in a fugoid, we stayed a little higher than we normally would have. Buying time, buying time, buying time. As long as we could, we kept the airplane up. The right engine, the direction of the turn, I put more power on than I would the left engine. That would keep the wing up, and if you keep a wing fairly level, the airplane will not turn. If I allowed the wing to drop, then I could let it turn right. The fugoid caused me to take power all the way off and all the way on, and that complicated it immensely. It just became like the airplane was an extension of me, and I could feel these stimuli coming at me before I actually felt them or saw them. It was work in progress all the way to the ground. I don't think I ever perfected it. It just got better little bit by little bit. There is a possibility that we can make this survivable. You were entertaining all kinds of places to land, if I'm not mistaken. Well, the captain was given choices by air traffic control. Des Moines is a possibility. Lincoln, Nebraska is a possibility. Omaha is a possibility. But in Captain Haynes' judgments, the behaviors he was seeing of the aircraft, the math just didn't add up. At the rate it was losing altitude, we would hit the ground prior to reaching any of those places. The decision was made to try to make it to Sioux City. That radar controller locally took over, and they were pointing out interstate highways. If you guys can't make the airport, here's some options for you. There's an interstate highway that runs north-south. There's one that runs east-west in case an airport no longer was viable. If you were to look at the track that we flew, we did four complete right 360 turns, and we did one left 180-degree turn. It was really questionable whether we were going to be able to keep it flying straight at Sioux City or not. One of the things that we wanted to know was where were we? The navigation station at the Sioux City Airport that tells us how far we are and what direction the airport is from the aircraft. Unfortunately, it was out of service that day, so we didn't have any onboard navigation capability to the airport. We were talking to the approach controller, and that gave us some positioning. As we got closer to the airport, one of the things that I realized by all this experimentation was that there were certain speeds that if I got near these speeds, I had the maximum capability of controlling the airplane. A normal DC-10 would approach the airport at about 150 miles per hour. I could not slow this airplane safely below 250 miles an hour. We were 100 miles an hour faster than normal. United 232 Heavy, if you can't make the airport, sir, there is an interstate that runs uh, north to south to the east side of the airport. Uh, it's a four-lane interstate. We're just passing okay. it right now. We're going to crash the airport. United 232 Heavy, roger. And advise when you get the airport in sight. Got a runway in sight. We'll be with you very shortly. Thanks a lot for your help.